more powerful than learning to do something strategy is possessing the absolute desire to actually do something regardless of learning. Hello and welcome to 28 Days to Better Chess Tactics Day 14. Today we're going to look at Annihilation of Defense. We're going into advanced tactics and deeper into the thought process. Now this is a progressive series so previously the tactics have been basic but now we're going to go really deep into much more complicated tactical positions and how to actually break it down and solve these positions. So when you're going through your training, you actually want to have a written down and understood thought process. I recommend this four-step thought process. You can adjust it to your own ideas, of course. But basically what your training is, is the process you use to solve a position, not just to learn a pattern or to learn a specific idea in a position, but you want to train an actual method to solve it. And eventually this method will become automatic, but you need to do a lot of training so that when you play a real game, uh, you don't have to go through the steps, it just happens. And this is what good players do, and this is how they reach a higher level in order to solve complicated positions, because it's subconscious and automatic for them at that point. So this four-step thought process that I cover is first you find what the opponent's threatening, then you figure out how you can start an attack or increase your activity, and then calculation of possibilities from your candidates in step two, and then a blunder check. All right, we'll go through this and the positions. So I chose this quote because it illustrates that we're not looking to just learn a mass of information, but we're actually trying to reduce information and apply a method. So your motivation is more important than the information. In position one, we're going to look at annihilation of defense, first off from the perspective of the thought process. So I'm gonna use this example position as kind of a primer of how to use the four-step thought process in more complicated positions. And we're gonna go really deep over the next 10 days of 28 Days to Better Chess Tactics because these 10 tactical motifs are going to be very challenging and even the initial position will just be a basic position compared to how complicated it could go. All right, so all these positions are real game positions either from my own games or from a book and we could see here that it's black to move. If you wanted to pause the video, you could try to go through the thought process yourself. <clears throat> but the first step is to find all of your opponent's threats, which is white in this case. You can see that white has his knight here. And first what you want to do is evaluate material. So we could see, especially, you know, if you're if you're looking at a position that is a puzzle. So material is equal, five pawns, two minor pieces, a rook and a queen. So nothing that we can evaluate there. We can see that white is threatening to take our knight and we have a slightly exposed king with the knight here but the heavy pieces, the rook and the queen are off to the side so there's really nothing they can do. It looks like we're playing in the center here uh, but in terms of white's threats there's also discovery on the queen so we need to keep these in mind. Now, the first step is to just discover every single possibility of your opponent. You're not trying to find your move. Now, the first step, the reason you want to do that is to see what your opponent's threatening. It doesn't mean that you're determining that you're going to respond to the threat. All right, so we move on to step two. So step two is figuring out how you can start an attack or to increase the activity of your pieces. Now I covered activity in my strategy course so you can check that out if you have any questions there. But when solving tactics what you're doing is you're finding all of the checks, captures, and threats basically. Now step two, again you shouldn't be judging any move. You should be very open-minded about all the possibilities. Now this means you should find every possibility you're not trying to find your move at this point. So in this example position, 
we can see that we have quite a few moves. We have check here, which we would love to play because it's a fork on the king, the rook, and the queen, but we, we know that the bishop's covering that square. But again, we're keeping this in mind. So knight check is a possible move. We can move this knight back somewhere to try to protect it. So that's another possible move. And we, we know that's a move that relates to activity because a pawn versus a knight, the pawn is worth less. So if we're going to lose material, that's one of the uh, two-pronged approach for evaluating activity. There's qualitative factor and the quantitative factor, which is material. So you don't want to lose material. All right, so another option is to bring another piece, your least active piece. So we have the rook, which is just sitting over here doing nothing. But of course, when we're looking for forcing moves, checks, captures, and threats, we want to look for every forcing move first, and then if those don't work, then we'll figure out how to increase our activity. So it's first figure out how to attack in step two. If you can't attack or you can't find any attacking moves, you look for moves that increase your activity. Okay, so another option is the queen to take this bishop. Now it seems ridiculous, but it's a forcing move. It's a capture. So we have knight check here, queen takes. We also have the pawn move. So there's essentially three moves, and we also have knight takes here, four moves. So there's four moves that we need to evaluate. Now, if those four moves don't work, we either move our knight back to protect it against the pawn capture, or we bring our rook in. So we'll, we always first evaluate the most forcing moves. So now we're into step three. We've figured out all the possibilities. And now we need to calculate which is looking as deeply as possible into the position to see how that move results or changes the evaluation of the position. So we can see here that knight check doesn't work because the bishop would just check the bishop would just take. And then of course we would like to just take the knight if that happens, but then the rook is threatening the queen. So oop go back here. So we're working on our visualization abilities as well. Now as you can see everything is kind of interrelated. You have your calculation, visualization, your evaluation. Now these are all separate skills. Visualization, some people are very good at calculation but not so much at visual visualization. You can look far ahead but if you can't visualize clearly what's going on then it'll be harder to evaluate. So we can see that the knight check doesn't work exactly. If we take the pawn, that doesn't necessarily work because the bishop would just take and now the rook is hitting our queen. So we just gave away a piece. So those moves don't work necessarily. So the only other totally forcing move is queen takes bishop. Now, if the queen takes the bishop, there's multiple recaptures. Or he could ignore it as well. Now, if queen takes bishop, then rook could take, but then we have check here, and now you need to visualize that the bishop does not exist anymore to cover the square. So it would look like this. If the queen takes and then the rook takes, this square is not covered. So now we actually do have a fork. Now, of course, in a check, the king has to move if it can't take this piece. So then we take the queen. Now, of course, your calculation shouldn't stop here. You should see that either the pawn can take this knight. We're also threatening the rook. So the rook would take. But then at the end of the line, we take this hanging knight. So you need to also evaluate if you can get this knight out because these squares are covered. And in the end, we can, because there's really no way that white can close the knight off yet. And we can always push our pawns to protect it or give it a square. So in that line, 
that's a winning evaluation. We could also see that white doesn't have to take with the rook, he can take with the pawn. So if he takes with the pawn, oh, let's go back here. If he takes with the pawn, we also have the check because the bishop is not covering that square. The king moves and then we can take. Now he can take with the pawn, but then we can take with our king. So we're up a piece again. So that's advantageous as well. So we know that queen takes either the pawn or the rook takes is a winning line. What if he tries to bring his knight back? Now the knight is hitting our queen and he's covering the square so we can't check. Of course we could still check but then he would just trade and then the end of the line so if he if we play here he would take with this knight and then at the end of the line he would just take our knight back so that's equal we don't want to go for that line. We want to try to keep the tension. We could take here, then the queen could take. Queen could take our knight. So that's not good either. It's equal. So if we move our queen back, now if the queen takes, then we can just actually take the knight because we still have that fork. So you can see calculation is really the hardest part here. It's figuring out all the candidates. Step one, two, and four are actually, are actually all leading to the calculation aspect to sort through the moves and the possible options. All right, so we could see that even with knight to f5, we still have queen to e5. What if the pawn takes? Of course, we can still take the knight, and then we have that fork. Now, it looks like we need to evaluate if white can trap our knight, but it looks like not because we have knight to a3. Now, of course, he couldn't bring here to try to cover that square because we just take it with his rook with our, he would just take his rook with our knight. All right, so you could see from the beginning of this position, it can go very complicated. Of course, step four, we're gonna cover here. Once you decide to play queen takes bishop, you need to visualize all the forcing responses and review them before you play the move. So you could see that it's just a final check to make sure that your clarity of visualization and calcul calculation is accurate. So you'd visualize queen takes bishop and all the possible captures or threats. And once you do that and you decide that there's no forcing move that white has from your decided move, then you can go ahead and play it. All right, you can see this is way more complicated than the simple tactics I've given you as a warm up, but this is really what forms the basis of your chess skill is getting better at calculating, visualize, visualizing, and going through a thought process to figure out chess positions where you have a lot of options. All right, so I'm going to present two more positions that you'll be able to solve, and we'll go through them so you get good practice. In position one here, it is white to move, and you can pause the video now. Okay, so in this position, we can see that it's quite complicated. Uh, but first, we want to go through step one and find all of Black's threats. So it looks like that uh, Black traded his queen for rook and minor piece, and white is on the attack here. But Black has some sinister threats with the discovery along the F file, as well as this pawn check. Uh, but notice that his rook and his bishop are really out of play, and if white can break through, 
such as a sacrifice, then he can really cut out all of Black's threats as well as go for mate. Uh, it looks like there's a check here, but of course the queen's covering that square. The knight's threatening this pawn, but that doesn't really do anything. So other than this pawn here threatening check, there's really no concrete threats that we need to worry about. So we'll go to step two and we'll look at all the forcing moves. So we have the bishop here kind of cutting into black's territory on the king's side and we'd love to play queen check so that's an idea but of course the knight's covering that for now. Um, we need to also worry we should have covered this in step one but the rook is also threatening to pin his bishop. All right so if we can sacrifice here with the rook takes, then we would be able to check, and we'll see where that leads. There's also pawn takes, but that's not really a threatening move. just keeps the material balance. We're going for something more, and this is why you always want to look for attacking moves, is you want to look for your most aggressive options, because that's what will lead you to a win. So the candidates that we can see pretty much is just rook takes and maybe move the bishop back threatening a check here but of course the rook can come in so you can see that this thought process really cuts out all the fat and leads you to the most aggressive options right away and it becomes rather obvious in these types of positions when you're calculating um, multiple variations of which moves are good and which moves are bad based on the underlying logic of the game all right, so if we look at rook takes, there's pretty much only one option, which is bishop takes. Now, the computer suggests something ridiculous, even though uh, black at this point is minus 10, so he's completely lost. Um, but a human would just play bishop takes rook, and we'd have to evaluate that line. So the obvious move next is queen check. And now, of course, we're going for mate here, and there's pretty much two moves. There's queen here threatening a discovery, as well as moving the bishop forward. Now, this is where your understanding of activity comes in. So, you want to move your pieces as forward as possible. Now, because this pawn is here, it prevents the queen from being pinned if the rook takes. But see, if we move our bishop forward and the rook takes, then we actually have checkmate. So, like this, because the pawn is preventing the king and the queen from being in line, we actually have checkmate that way. So black won't go for that, but of course we're threatening mate here on h7. Now, these two pieces are out of play, so the only piece that he has, well, of course he can check, but we just move our king out of the way. The only move he has is rook to f7, and of course we'll just take it, and eventually we'll mate him. There's some computer moves, but it leads to mate after a few moves. All right, so going back previously, we can see that our candidates were cut out pretty fast from step two. And the calculation, now if he doesn't take, if he plays the computer suggested line of bishop to c8, which not only violates the principal activities moving back, but he's trying to control some light squares, but we should be able to evaluate. Now, this is where we differ from a computer. We don't need to look at the entire line. We can evaluate that we just took a piece for free, and if he doesn't take with the pawn or with the bishop, then we just want a piece for free. So, of course, we should play that move. Now, of course, we'll go through this line. So, queen to g6, and then he can just bring his rook over, and now we just want a piece and we're bringing our rook into the attack. Of course he has a check here and it just kind of goes on. Um, you know, these moves, you don't need to calculate every single line. You just need to be able to evaluate the position. So you could see here that the computer is suggesting these kind of ridiculous moves that are just giving away material and they're really his only best option. Now, would a human find these? Not necessarily. Uh, and even if they did, you'd still win. So, of course, 
we'll go to step four. We've done our calculation and we've decided to play rook takes. Now we'll look at all the aggressive applies. What about pawn takes? Now, of course, we'll just move our king over as we would anyway. It stops the pawn and there's no other check because this pawn is preventing the bishop from coming in. So there's pretty much just pawn check. Of course, if the pawn takes, then we end up with a similar position as well. You can see here it's plus 10. And after the king goes, then we'll just play the same line and we'll end up with rook to f7. All right, so that was the first position that you should have solved for Annihilation of Defense. You can see these are a lot more complicated and in-depth than the basic positions, but they use the same thought process to get the same result. All right, moving on to position two. In position two, it is white to move, and you can pause the video now. All right, so starting from step one, what is black threatening? You can see that black has this bishop on c3 that he's threatening to take, and then he'll take the knight. So he's threatening basically to win a piece there, if it was his move. Uh, maybe g6, but that's actually a really bad idea. Of course, he could threaten the queen, but the queen would just move, and then the dark squares would be weak. Uh, you should notice that white is basically playing on the king side for an attack, preferably a mating attack, and black's pieces are pretty passive. So there's really no moves for this bishop. These two rooks don't have any threats. And other than this knight and this bishop, there's really no contact between the pieces. So we can move on to step two. All right, so step two, we'll look at all of our attacking moves, all the forcing options. Now there is rook takes f6 and bishop takes f6. Of course, you should look at queen to f or queen to h7, but you'll easily discount that because that would just lead to loss of your queen for a pawn. So don't do that. All right, so we can bring the knight in, bring the knight back to keep it. You know, so of course for activity, an, a move back is bad, but if you're going to lose a material, then you'd rather save it than lose it. So we pretty much just have two attacking options, bishop takes and rook takes. Again, step two is leading us to cutting down all the possibilities to only the good ones. This saves a lot of time. Instead of just trying to calculate from the beginning and just randomly finding moves, you're actually doing it systematically. And once you are good at this method, it's very, very fast. You'll be able to do it very, very quickly. Eventually, it'll become automatic. All right, so we'll look at rook takes bishop first because it's actually the most forcing and we want to keep our bishop for a mating attack. So we see that rook takes f6, pawn takes. If the pawn takes, then actually bishop takes and we have a winning mating attack because there's really no way for black to prevent all the threats. We're threatening queen to g5, check. We're also threatening queen to h6, check, and mate. So he can bring his pawn here and threaten the bishop, but of course we'll get queen to g5 in first. Um, there's kind of a desperate move with bishop here, but of course we could just take it, and then we have the same threat of queen to g5, or we could just move here, queen to h6, and now there's no way to prevent queen to g7 mate. So that's a good option. Uh, we can see that he can't take with the pawn. He can't take the rook. So we've basically just won a piece for nothing. Um, what other options does he have? Now, sometimes when you'll find a good move like that right away, you'll just kind of play it and not think about it. But you want to calm down and look at other moves that he has in between. He's not forced to capture. It's not a check. So the only other move really is either queen back, or which doesn't do anything, or trying to bring his rook in with rook a to e8. And then we see that either we can just move the rook back. That's definitely a good option. 
but we can also increase the pressure on the g7 square. We can play queen to g5. Now we're threatening a discovery. Rook takes and then queen to g7 mate, winning the queen. So if he plays rook d7, then we actually have this move, which is a discovery on the rook, as well as mating attack. And so if he takes, then we're left winning a bishop, because if he plays here, then either the rook will have to go back, or we'll just win the bishop once he moves it there. So he doesn't want to do that. Of course, if the bishop takes, then we just get made in. All right, so during our calculation phase, you should look at every possibility from the other side as well. So that means, and this is a point I want to make, is that when you're looking at candidate moves, you also have to figure out the opponent's candidates with the same objectivity as your own. And if you don't do that, then you'll play strong moves to yourself, but you'll miss strong opportunities in the first, second, third variation of a line. Now, this is where calculation, this is why you have to practice it, because the more you practice it, the easier it gets, and you miss less. But, of course, even you practice it a long time, you'll still have miscalculations. It's a part of the game. But you can see here that rook takes works. And now what about bishop takes? We should still look at bishop takes. Now, oh, all right, so if bishop takes, pawn takes. Now if rook takes, then we actually just lose a piece. Queen takes knight, and we pretty much only have a knight and a rook, and this knight really isn't doing much, so there's really no option for a mating attack at this point. Now, we could bring the rook up, let's see. So if he took, we could bring the rook up and that might happen, but we need to look that the queen doesn't have to take the knight. Can he prevent us from having a winning mating attack? The rook in this case isn't as strong as the bishop because the bishop was cutting through the king's dark squares. And the bishop and queen combination is very deadly for that kind of mating attack. He could also bring this pawn up Let's check that. Yeah, if he brings, if we bring our rook up, then it looks like the computer is suggesting queen takes. Now he's touching this pawn. And actually it's saying black's winning in this case because he'll win this knight. All right, so that doesn't necessarily work, and we've already found a winning line with rook takes. So this is another point. Sometimes when you're calculating and you see two moves possibilities, if you look at the first line and it's winning, then you should quickly check the other line, and if it doesn't have an advantage or it's unclear, in this case it would be unclear because it's not sure exactly what black should play, right away, but it's not clear that we're winning or we have a winning attack. So you'd simply go or you'd go to step four and blunder check rook takes f6. Now the only other forcing move is pawn takes the rook or him bringing his rook in or him bringing his queen back and trying to prevent mate. So we can see that after rook takes, the only forcing move, pawn takes rook, doesn't work. So at this point we'd be able to play rook takes, oh, not that move, we'd be able to play rook takes and we'd evaluate it as winning for white. Thanks for watching everybody. This was kind of a long lesson but I feel like I covered everything in depth so that for the other nine parts we'll be able to get through it all and you'll understand everything. Leave a comment, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.